in this series. In the last video, we introduced the notion of Hilbert space. Hilbert space is a particular case of Banach space where a notion of scalar product called inner product can be defined. And the scalar product is some operation between vectors which gives us information about the norm, okay, the norm can be fully determined in terms of the uh, inner product, as well as introducing to us the concept of angles, okay, the same way as in Rn, the scalar product gives us information about the angle between two vectors, okay. As examples of Hilbert spaces, we saw the Rn spaces as well as L2, which is somehow a generalization of them. And we also saw that uh, spaces like C0 is not a Hilbert space. Okay? The last example we were seeing was what is called L2 of an interval. Which means, uh, this, this is the following set. It is the set of functions on A, B, such that this operation is finite. This operation, the square root of the integral of the square of the modulus, actually defines a norm in this space. Okay? It can be checked that this satisfies all the conditions for a norm. And more than that, this operation here, this operation here, is actually an inner product. Okay? It satisfies all the axioms of, of inner products. And actually, you can somehow see the resemblance between this and this. Okay? Indeed, this norm comes from this inner product. So it turns out that this space is a Hilbert space. Okay? To be fully formal, we would have to actually identify functions that are equal except for a small amount of points. But we will omit that part for now. Okay? So, it turns out that the space of functions satisfying this form a Hilbert space. And indeed, we have some notion of orthogonality, okay? even if it's not as geometrical as in Rn. So we say that two functions, two vectors, are orthogonal if their product is zero. Okay? Similar to what happened in Rn. So, what is nice about this Hilbert space is that it has a shoulder basis. That is, a countable amount of functions which are able to generate every function here with just countable linear combinations. Okay? So, the cosinus of multiples of x times some random number that depends on a and b, and the sine function of multiples of x times some number depending on a and b, actually form an orthogonal shoulder basis. Okay? The fact that they are sh a shoulder basis is already nice enough because it means that any function in here, whatever function you can think of in here, can be expressed as a countable linear combination of functions of this kind. But not only they are a shoulder basis, they are an orthogonal shoulder basis. If you calculate the integral, of these products for a, a number of rate uh, omega, it will give always zero. Okay? Now, ah, and that's, that's a shoulder basis for the real case, and for the complex case, uh, we have that the exponentials of this kind are shoulder basis. Okay? So, how can we apply this knowledge? Well, similar to what happened in Rn, We are going to take some function and we are going to express the function as a multiple of this one, a number, plus multiples of these functions plus multiples of this one. And as long, as long as our function is in the space, we can always do this uh, kind of thing. But 
Uh, this is because this is a shorter basis, but it is also orthogonal. And if a basis is orthogonal, finding the coefficients of a vector is actually an easy task. Okay? And why is that so? That is so because if f is all that, a0 times 1 plus a1 cosine of 1 over x plus a2 cosine of 2 over x plus this is a terrible notation, but I think you will understand the idea at least. 1 over x plus b2 uh, b2 sine of 2 over x and so on. If you take this function and you multiply it by any of these things, for example, by cosinus of 47 omega x and now you use all the properties from inner products that it is linear in the first component so you can split this into many inner products and each of them will give always the number 0 because of the orthogonality of the basis except for the cosinus of 47 Okay, so if you make all the operations like uh, using the properties of inner products, you get that all this is just this number times something uh, that you can calculate. Because this is the integral of a product of cosinus, you can calculate that thing. So it turns out that f times this allows us to find which number is this one. And the same holds for every other component of the basis. Okay? In R n we use exactly this idea when we have orthogonal basis. Okay? So, uh, since we know the original function, we know the cosinus and sine functions, we can calculate this. We can calculate this. The only thing we don't know is the coefficient which we can calculate. Okay? And that's what is nice about this space. The fact that, that we not only have a shoulder basis but an orthogonal shoulder basis gives us a really easy way to calculate the coefficients of any vector in this basis. And now, here comes the essential uh, thing of this. Here comes the essential thing of this. This procedure of taking some function which is defined on some interval. And expressing it as a combination of sine functions and cosine functions is what is called Fourier series. Okay? And Fourier series are a really, really nice tool in mathematics which has many real-world applications, okay? For example, when you take a cell phone or a computer, how does it process images or sound? Images, uh, images are an infinite amount of information, okay? And yet, Cell phones are able to take a picture and tell you, hey, this is the picture, you can look at it. Okay? How does it do it? Well, this is simple uh, wording maybe, but the idea is that it uses Fourier series. It takes functions, which are the things in the picture, and it approximates it by uh, functions which are easy to draw. Okay? 
wave functions, which are easy to draw. And the same goes for audio, actually. If you have some wave of audio, some sound, uh, and you know that this is exactly equal to all of these, and you know also that you have some sort of good convergence, uniform absolute convergence of what or whatever, you could say, okay, I don't need all of the elements. Let's add at the one hand. You are actually removing the error components, which are very small. And this is used to cancel noise, to cancel unneeded information. Okay? Here we can see an idea in the slides. If we have some function which is periodic, if we have some function which is nice behaving and periodic, for example, some stairs, uh, because it is periodic, we could consider, let's draw a little bit more, we could consider just this bit. and say, well, we are repeating this bit over and over and over, right? We are repeating this bit over and over and over. So, this is as if we were taking a function from this point A to this point B. And we are now going to approximate this function by sums of sinus and cosines. So, if we cut the series at 1, we will get probably something like this. And if we cut this series at 2, we will probably get something of this shape. Okay? And if we cut at 3, it will probably be something of this shape. In the picture, you see some iterations of of this procedure, okay, you are calculating new and new and new and more and more new terms of this series, and you can clearly see that the wave is approximating the function each step even more and more and more and more. How much will we approximate? As much as we want. We set some error bound and we cut the series where we want. Because we cannot compute an infinite amount of sums, but we can compute a finite amount of them. Okay? So we will choose the appropriate one. Now, take a picture, a closed core in the plane. A closed core in the plane. Say this. If you imagine this thing as a moving curve, you are at this point and you are moving it around. The coordinate x does this. Okay? And if you assign a time as an x coordinate and do this, you will get some thing that is periodic. Now, what about the y-coordinate? The y-coordinate starts here and does something like this. Okay? So, if you assign time as the x-coordinate and put the images in the y-coordinate, you will get something like this. And then it is periodic. Okay? Doesn't matter much if I view it correctly or not. Uh, okay, let's throw it correctly. Okay? We are starting here and we are moving to the left, then we are moving to the right, 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 left. Okay? So we can uh, represent the x coordinates at some periodic function and the y coordinate at some periodic, as some periodic function. Now, we can approximate each of them by a Fourier series. Okay? And this will allow us 
to represent this curve parametrically speaking as a few Fourier series which we can calculate okay? if we have this function we can calculate its Fourier series and this is exactly what uh, Wolfram Alpha does for example when you ask for the Picasso curve the Picasso curve is some closed curve okay? and when you move around the curve always at the same speed the x coordinate does some periodic thing the y coordinate does some periodic thing right and each of them will be approximable by some Fourier series okay so you can represent equations for this curve parametrically expressed by expressing this as its Fourier series and this as a Fourier series and that's why in, uh, in, the, in Wolfram Alpha it tells us that the equation of the Picasso curve is just this nice sum which is actually like 5 times bigger what I am showing in screen okay? but if you pay close attention to the shape of this sum you will know that the parametric equation for x in terms of time is a sum of sine functions and the parametric equations of y in terms of time is also a sum of sine functions and here you have a clear application of Fourier to a real life problem which is really important which is being able to draw Pikachu and notice that in Wolfram Alpha they only use sine functions but that makes sense we don't need cosines at all because cosine of 2 pi minus 6, uh, no sorry, cosine of pi pi minus 6 is the same as sine of x. Okay? This relation is easy to spot uh, geometrically okay? because they are. They, they, they are uh, symmetric uh, notions with respect to the diagonal so you don't really need cosines at all because you can turn them into sine functions okay, and that's why Wolfram Alpha has only sine functions here okay so let's see a moving example of a curve being built using Fourier here you have a curve being built through time using Fourier. As you can see, the image is built uh, by using circles, okay, and once the pattern finishes the curve starts all over again if you are wondering why summing circles that are over circles is the same as doing Fourier remember that a circle is a curve of coordinates cosine sine okay and if you from this point from this moving point you add a new circle you are adding a new cosine and a new sine and so on and so on and so on. So essentially you are summing cosines and sine functions as in Fourier. So this is exactly what Fourier does. Okay? Now, for the final and most abstract section of this course, let me just give some few nice concepts and results from Banach space theory. First of all, if you have a normal space, Linear mappings from the space to the field of scalars are the algebraic dual of the space. And the continuous and linear mappings, which are called functional, as I recall you, is the topological dual. Now, uh, when in functional analysis, it is really common to call dual to the topological dual. Okay, we, we want continuity of mappings. And so the word topological is usually omitted. And this space is often written like this. Okay, X star. Now, remember that the operation.
operators from two known spaces form a known space itself, and when this is a Banach, which is the case, this is actually a Banach. So the dual of a space, of a normal space, is a Banach space which is associated to it somehow naturally. Okay? Uh, now, the thing is the following. You can consider now, since this is a Banach space, the dual of this space, which is the by dual. These are continuous and linear mappings over this set of continuous and linear mappings, as abstract as and where that, that is from. Okay? And you can actually do that forever and ever. And the thing is that a Banach space X is always somehow contained in the right one. This is not too accurate or too formal, and actually they are not even the same kinds of things. These are points and these are mappings, okay? But to each X, you can trivially associate one mapping in that space, as we will do right now. So, so take from X to the dual, Take a point and you will associate it to the following mapping. This mapping, remember, is from the dual of the dual. So it acts on the functionals and gives us a real number or a complex number. How is it defined? Well, this will act on some functional. Okay? And the way to make it related to this point is to simply define it as the functional evaluated on the point. So each point is trivially associated to this function which simply evaluates at the point. Okay? Uh, now, this association, usually denoted as the mapping J, justifies that each point can be seen as some mapping from the by dual. Which mapping? The evaluation mapping. So indeed, a Banach space X can be seen as some subset of their by dual. Okay? Now, when this mapping is surjective, that is, when we not only associate to each point one by dual mapping, but uh, every by dual mapping is of this form, and we are not missing anyone. Okay, when we are covering the wall by dual by this operation, we say that the space is reflexive. Now, among all the Banach spaces, reflexive spaces are the ones that behave the, better, the best. Okay, some examples of reflexive spaces would be LP for one smaller than two smaller than infinity, every Hilbert space, and every finite dimensional space. Reflexive spaces have many nice properties. They play really nicely with their duals. Every functional attains their norm. Okay? No, they are not only dense, they all of them attain their norms, and they behave very well. A uh, shocking example are Hilbert spaces, where actually we get that the dual of a Hilbert space, not the by dual, the dual of a Hilbert space is the same space as the original Hilbert space. Yes, these ones are points and these ones are mappings, but you can trivially associate to each point one mapping. Okay? And this is a really nice program. Okay? Uh, now, there are other properties, for example, remember that Banach spaces have some balls. And so, the concept of smoothness, which means not having spikes, and the concept of rotundity, which is uh, looking like a circle, behaving like a circle, can be studied formally. And these happen to be somehow dual concepts, in the sense that 
if the ball of a space is smooth, the ball of the dollar will be rotund and vice versa. Okay? And precisely the ability of drawing the ball of a balanced space like this, okay, in general, you, you, you can assume that the ball is just some circle in the plane, the plane of X. You can now imagine functionals as planes somehow, and so you can represent the functionals by their level sets. Okay? So concepts like attaining the norm can be seen as level sets approaching the sphere of the ball. Okay? And this allows for the following very nice result to be geometrically interpreted. For example, this is uh, called the Hamman theorem. Hamman theorem. And what this theorem tells us essentially is that if you have some mapping which is a function over some small set M, then you can extend it to the wall space. Okay? You can extend it to the wall space. And not only you can extend it as a functional, continuous and linear, but it can preserve the norm and the properties, the behavior of this mapping. Okay? Now, this is a really abstract concept, but this has a geometrical interpretation, even though the relation is not trivial to see, which is that from this we can actually get that if we have in a Banach space two closed sets, there exist uh, two closed sets which are convex and disjoint. Okay, this one is not convex, but there exists some functional which separates them in the sense that it will be positive here and negative here. Okay? And precisely this geometrical interpretation leads to the following shocking fact. If you have here the ball of a balanced space and you have any point in the ball, there always exists a functional which attains its norm at this point. Okay, so not every functional attains their norm, but every norm is a norm where a functional attains their norm. Okay, if that makes any sense. Remember that the dual space is somehow bigger than the original space. And to end this course, yeah, let's, let me show a few nice theorems from the space theory, uh, theory. So, for example, the open mapping theorem, which tells us that the closed graph theorem tells us that a linear mapping is continuous if and only if the graph is a closed set, and the Uniform boundedness principle, which is by Max Steinhaus theorem, tells us that when we have a sequence of operators which point by point form a bounded set, then their norms must also form a bounded set. That is, then their norms cannot approach infinity. So, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you found this course instructive, entertaining, and you learn things. And I hope this was useful or at least nice for you.